Welcome to this episode of the Cool Tool Show and Tell. Our special guest this week is Paige Nijing. Paige, would you like to introduce yourself to our watchers and listeners? Sure. So I'm a big fan of the show. So this is a bucket list item for me. Well, oh, great. Um, yeah. And so I live outside of Boston. I run a house painting company. Um, and I also was one of the volunteer writers for the Carbon Almanac, which is the um, best-selling book about climate change that was just came out in July. Well, fantastic. Well, we're really, I'm really, really interested in hearing um, what some of your tool picks are. And um, I also like to hear about house painting because that was the one job I did when I was in high school to earn money. And I hated it. But yes, most people do. <laughs> anyway, anyway, uh, um, not to derail the conversation. Let's hear about your tools. Um, what um, what's your first pick for us? Yeah, so um, my first pick, and I'll hold it up, but I'll also describe it for the listeners, is um, this little, very satisfying um, group of um, I would call them little toiletry. Mm -hmm. containers um, that are magnetic and they stick together. And they're um, in they're the shape of a hexagon. So the whole thing is like a little honeycomb, but yeah, like a honeycomb, but about two inches in, across at the top, each cell, each cell is about two inches. Yeah. And they're so satisfying. They're like hefty. So, oh, I just dropped it. Um, but it, they, they hold so much more than you think. And there's no more need to sort of go to CVS and buy the little travel sizes anymore. Um, they hold like for, for, this is the one that is for pills. Uh -huh. um, I'm going to say I could get 10 little capsules, capsules in there. Mm -hmm. um, if it was a larger vitamin, maybe you could get six in there. Mm -hmm. um, but they hold a lot more than you think. But I don't know. They're just like, they just make me smile when I use them. And the funny part is, is that I bought them for my husband for Christmas, knowing that I wanted them. <laughs> and I just, I just swipe them. Um, so he didn't really have a chance to um, to use them. So um, this, these are things like you'd keep in shampoo, body lotion, all this kind of stuff. And is this something you travel with or is this just something that resides on your counter in your home? So I travel with them, but I suppose you could um, travel with them. You know, the they're not I mean, there's not a lot of shampoo in here. So maybe you could get three or four um three or four uh, hair washes out of it. So probably you wouldn't want to keep that in your bathroom, but I guess you could. Um, and I actually, you know what I want to do? I brought along some water and I wanted to show you, I filled up this regular, you know, CVS Neutrogena container. Uh -huh. And I figured we would just kind of, I would show you how much fits in here. Okay. It's, so you're, so you're pouring uh, a three ounce container, I guess. Yep. Of water and I, into into one of these cells. And these cells are kind of about two inches across and maybe three inches high. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so I was able to get if, if you could see, you can't see what right. I see, but um, I was able to get about three quarters of a regular travel size into here. Right. So. Um, so, you know, it's it they're they're quite there's there's a lot of room in them, right. um, which I think I was a little worried about when I saw them myself. I thought, oh, I don't know if I'll, if I'll be able to um, put a lot of things, uh, put a lot of liquid or uh, or sunscreen in there. But you can. And the um, the idea that they're magnetic so that they cluster together like a honeycomb. That's exactly. very space efficient in terms of their mm -hmm. packing. And that's the idea. Right. Right. The only downside is the price. I, I even shudder to tell you what I paid for these. Um, I think it was 65. I think they're a little more expensive now with inflation. Um, I, but I, I, um, I justified it because it was a present for my husband <laughs> and that I stole. Well, if it makes, you know, if it's, if you get sparks of joy when you use them, they're worth it. Yes. I completely agree. I completely agree. I think you have to be so careful with tools, right? You get one that's almost right or not the right color and you live with it for the rest of your life. And you're like, Oh, why didn't I just get the pink one that I wanted? And what do you, what are they called again? They're, they're by a company called cadence and they're called honeycomb travel containers. And you just go on. Um, I think it's just cadence.com or the cadence capsules, perhaps. Yes. Um, it's a capsule system from cadence. And um, some people go to town and they have 20 of them uh, in their own little um, 
stack, which they can put into a bag. So yeah, um, yeah the cadence system. So it's a system. Great. Yeah. Um, so Paige, tell us about another um, tool that you um, would hate to live without. So um, a little self-promotion, and it's not really self-promotion because it was a volunteer effort, but I do want to talk about the Carbon Almanac as a tool um, and explain to you how people can use it as a tool. Mm -hmm. So this is an almanac. And if you're young and don't know what an almanac is, it's like sort of like the Guinness Book of World Records, right? You can sort of open it to any page and learn something. Um, and so when I started um, writing about climate change, I was a rookie. Um, I didn't think I was a rookie until I sort of got around people that really knew what they were talking about. And I thought, oh my goodness, I really um, am a little confused here. And so I actually wrote the section of the book. Um, if you go to the edge of the book, the black section that's sort of you know highlighted there, you can open it to the section called climate change for rookies. Mm -hmm. And um, it was really important to me to um, to write for rookies because I was only five minutes ahead of them mm -hmm. in my knowledge. And so I could really relate. And the reason it's so important that we use something like the Carbon Al Almanac as a tool is because so many of us we all know we want to do something, we, but we, we just maybe haven't Googled it, right? We haven't taken the time to really learn about it. And so we don't, we don't know how to talk about it. So it might come up at a cocktail party or at a dinner and you, you change the subject because you're not exactly sure of your facts. Mm -hmm. And um, the Carbon Almanac gives you a really, really, um, a, a really, really broad view of so many different subjects. There's charts, but nothing is... Um, hard to understand. Mm -hmm. um, the people that wrote the charts were the, they were geniuses. They could take a chart that seems so complicated at first and make it so simple. Um, so that really when you open it, you could open to any page and learn something. Okay. And the, the theme of the carbon uh, almanac is that um, it's kind of like introducing or giving you the facts about climate change. Is that Exactly. Yes, exactly. And the idea is that um, if you know a few facts, mm -hmm. you can talk about it. And, you know, a lot of people think like, how can I help? Right. You know, oh, I recycle and I I might drive a hybrid or something like that. But look, I was able to help by writing, which you never would expect. Right. You never expect like, oh, how do you help climate change by writing? Well, I did it, right? And so just because I was not afraid to learn the facts, I could say, well, this is a skill I have. How can I put it towards climate change? Mm -hmm. um, I've always said, like, you don't need to run for office to do this. You don't need to go picketing. You can make sandwiches for a green candidate's office, right? If you're a good cook. Right. Um, so there's so many ways to help, but we first have to start by, um, by understanding what we're helping. Right. So this is the um, Carbon Almanac, and I assume that it's on um, Amazon. Yes, Build correct. Amazon, and um, it looks like a pretty hefty book. Um, lots of pages in pretty big format. Very, yeah, there it is. It's not too Yeah, big. it's about 300 pages. That's my, um, in my general motto, uh, one of my talking points that it's not too late. We're just getting exactly. started. We have time yes, to, to do absolutely. amazing things. So, um, so Paige, what's, what's a third tool for you? All right. So a third tool for me is a book. Um, and it is a book that has helped me and so many people who are in chronic pain. The book is called The Way Out, and it's by Dr. Um, Alan Gordon, who is a licensed social worker. Okay. Um, and what's so interesting about his um, his theory, and it really, really helped me, is that acute pain, you break your leg, right? Mm -hmm. It's there for a reason. The, your body doesn't want you walking on that leg. Right. Um, when that pain, when that leg heals and um, you're still experiencing pain or you find yourself a year later having pain in that spot and you go, oh, well, that's where I broke my leg. Um, it's probably chronic pain. And what they're finding is, and um, Alan Gordon is one of the um, like sort of heads of the research of all of this, what they're finding is that um, chronic pain is actually in your brain. 
And um, what's happened is it's like your your brain is sort of misfiring and you have, um, it's almost like a neural pathway that's been like worn down a little too much. It's like a wheelbarrow that goes along a path. Mm -hmm. And you have to sort of, un first of all, understand that it's not your leg or your foot. For me, it was my foot and my back. Um, and once I understood that and accepted it, um, it was very easy to get completely out of pain. Um, he also does a podcast. It's a very short podcast. There's only a few episodes, but it's called Tell Me About Your Pain, where he really clearly explains to you the theory. And you can you can hear real people getting out of pain, people who are in an incredible amount of pain, not being able to get out of bed. Um, so it has been life changing to me. Um, however, let me tell you the, the caveat here. I have been um, I've told a lot of people about this book because anytime somebody tells me they have back pain, I, I recommend it. And people um, tend to not believe me. Right. And so I always say like, well, it's just a book. It's just a podcast. If it doesn't work, it's, you know, it's, we're not, it's not anything um, that is going to kill you. But um, I, anybody that has read it after I've recommended it has gotten out of pain. Mm -hmm. um, and what, a, like what a tool, right? Right. Exactly. What a tool. There's a, there's a similar book that's been around since the seventies uh, called mind over back pain. Yes. It's Dr. Sarno's book. Sarno's right. Mm -hmm. So how does this one compare to that? Are they aligned or there, is there a difference? Um, what happens? Did you yeah. read that book and it not work or what? Yeah. So anyway, um, yes, they are very similar. Dr. Sarno was before his time. There was not the kind of magnetic um, imagery right. that we that he could use right. to sort of prove his point. He just had sort of this this knowledge of people coming in to his office and not having anything structurally wrong with them. That was one of the clues. Dr. Sarno says is that like people will say like they can't find anything wrong with me. Right. That's a clue, right? That they've done all the tests and and you seem fine. Um, what Alan Gordon has done is simplified it. Um, I think his book is a little easier to read um, and the science is there now. Mm -hmm. So now you don't have to sort of hope that Dr. Sarno is right. Alan Gordon is proving it with um, the scientific, the, I, the scientifically proven approach to chronic pain. Yeah. Well, that's really great because Sarno's books help, help me with my back pain. The same thing was like, uh, that seems kind of weird just to believe it's all in my head, but um, it did help. It, it actually yes. did help. I was a patient of Dr. Sarno's when I was in my 20s with the back pain. And so this was not hard for me when when the pain moved to my foot. I didn't recognize it as the same pain. And so, um, yes, I I um, I was so helped. And I'm so glad that I had an open mind in the elevator where somebody told me about the book. OK, well, that's a great recommendation. Um, and the book, again, is called The Way Out. Um, a revolutionary scientifically proven approach for healing chronic pain. Yes. Well, that's fantastic. Um, so you're on a roll Paige. How about a, another one, a fourth one? All right, sure. So um, the next one is a quiz that is online. It also relates to a book that um, Gretchen Rubin wrote, but her little quiz um, is so powerful. And I'm going to explain to you um, what it does and why I can't get enough of it. Mm -hmm. All right. So um, sh the quiz will teach you um, what tendency you are. Now, a tendency, according to Gretchen, is how you respond to an outer or an inner expectation. So there are people who respond to outer and inner expectations alike. They can do that. No problem. Um, they can keep a news resolution, which is an inner expectation, and they can also like drive somebody to the airport, which is an outer expectation. Um, so that is that person is she calls an upholder. All right. So then I am an obliger. So I have a hard time with her, with my inner expectations. It is harder for me to keep um, a news resolution than it is for me to drive somebody to, to drop everything and drive somebody to the airport. Right. That is, that's just me. I will drop it and go. Even if, even if I'm, you know, even if there was a massage scheduled, right. Even if I'm looking forward to something. Um, so that is called an obliger. Um, I oblige, right. My son Lewis is a questioner. 
he will only do something if he thinks um, if there's sort of if, if he can make it an inner expectation and see how it will affect him. Mm-hmm. And then my son, Matthew, is a um, is a rebel and he can only do what he wants to do. So what is this has given me as a parent and also as a manager of a company? It, when I know somebody's tendency, which after you sort of get into the book, the, the book is called The Four Tendencies, um, and then you can take your, your quiz. But once you have a, just a, cup, a little bit of knowledge about this, you can spot the tendency without the quiz. So for my son, Lewis, who's the questioner, what I have to do is to say, if I want him to do something, right, he doesn't want an, an outer expectation on him. I have to explain to him upfront how it is going to um, make his life better, right? So I might say, um, can you come, let's go get some lunch if you come pick me up. I'm telling him like, tell me why so that he comes and picks me up. Um, For my son, Matthew, I have to find out what he wants to do and then let him do it. Mm -hmm. He can do anything he wants to do, but um, he will get in the way of himself if it's not something that he wants Mm -hmm. to do. Um, using this in parenting and in managing is like magic. Once you know the tendency, it's really, really easy to figure out how to talk to people. Mm-hmm. For somebody like me, who's an obliger, I need accountability. So if you and I wanted to work out, Kevin, and you said, Paige, you're going to work out in your house and I'm going to work out at my house, that might not work for me. But if I was meeting you to go play tennis, I would never miss that. Right. right. So that's the kind of that's the kind of accountability I need to work out. And um, does Gretchen give a um, a way to kind of assess the tendencies for people who you can't force them to take the quiz? Like they say they're your employees or something or right. uh, vendors for that matter. Um, do you do you have are there techniques for learning how to assess those categories for people? Yeah, I think that if you just read up a little bit on it, which you can go to her website, um, it's Mm GretchenRubin.com. And also read the book, even just skim it a little bit, you you can spot it. Mm. So somebody in my office that I notice drops everything and, you know, helps somebody else, Mm. even if it's not that person's um, job, I, I probably know that that's person's an obliger and I have to protect that person too. Right. I have to protect that person from, from doing that too much and not, you know, keeping her own, um, her own uh, self. uh, Right. And the, the upholders, what, what, um, what were they again? Yeah. So my son, Joey is an upholder. So what an upholder is. Wow. (laughs) I have one of each. And then my husband and I are both obligers. So we're just like, you know, we just let them walk all over us. Um, so so Joey um, is, he can keep an ex- external expectation and an internal expectation, no problem. But what happens, and you notice this with upholders, is they, they, get, um, they get really um, firm about things. So if I said to Joey, um, look, your grandmother's coming over at two o'clock, um, you know, you should be around. But Joey had maybe something to do at two o'clock. It would be really hard for him to say, I'm going to not do that. They sort of tighten up, right? They tighten up about their, um, so that's how you can recognize an upholder, somebody that is just a little bit inflexible. Um, now, obviously there's some, there's great things about being an upholder because you can, you can manage those expectations. Okay. But that is how you can, you can really notice somebody. And according to, I'm getting kind of deep in here because I'm interested, but according to Gretchen's um, theory, do people generally land at one of the four corners or do are there people who are kind of like um, one fourth this, one fourth that, one third this? Yeah. So she says, and I, I've seen it, right? Uh-huh. So she says people um, are usually square in one corner and then maybe tip to something that is touching them. So an up, a, obliger like me could tip to upholder, which I don't. Um, I tip to rebel. Mm -hmm. Um, So I, if somebody asks me, and I noticed this, like if somebody asked me to read a book, I'm be like, I don't know. I I don't really want to, right? Like it's hard for me to take a recommendation, even though here I am recommending. Um, uh, It's harder for me because I'm like, maybe I just don't want to do that. So I definitely tip to rebel. 
Um, my husband tips to, he's an obliger that tips to upholder. So there's, there's like a tip sort of like a, um, in astrology, when you have like your moon is in another, uh, another month. <laughs> right. Um, there was another kind of personality assessment um, system where they did the good thing was um, you, you had your entire network, like family, take it. And then it gave you hints. Like if you're an upholder, here's how you deal with a rebel. If you're a rebel, here's how you deal with the obliger. And I thought that was really cool. So I don't know if she's yeah, gone all that. That's way. really juicy. Yeah, I mean, yeah. that that's like a um, a magic eight ball. Yeah, yeah, and it wasn't um, those. It wasn't the same categories, but the, but the the genius was you have a, it gave you all the different kind of pairings and tips on how to relate to them, given your different pairings. And oh, that's fascinating. Yeah, um, it was based on. Um, I have to dig it up, but it was uh, it was fairly complicated. The quiz or the assessment was quite involved, although fun, not not hard. Um, and um, I, I think it's not that far uh, misaligned from what Gretchen was doing in terms of right uh, of things. But they had different names. Yeah. Do you think it was Myers Briggs? No, no, Maybe it was not Myers Briggs. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It, I mean, it was, how... it, was a, it was a more recent one. It was in the last two years. Um, and it was, was based on some, um, some academic work. It's fascinating because it's, it really is like, I can talk to my children um, in a way that I'm not nagging anymore. Right. In a way that they're hearing me as a loving mother instead of a naggy mother. And same thing with my, my staff. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's really great. Um, okay. So that's, um, that quiz from Gretchen is the um, on her website, Gretchen Rubin's website, and she's the Happiness Project. Um, yeah. woman. She she um, that's been her thing. So these are all kind of in in the quest to be happy, right? Right, right. If you don't have to be a nag, I guess you're happier. <laughs> or you have to be, or you don't want to be nagged. Yeah. So so. You nagged right exactly well, i mean that would be that would be I th the thing for me is like yeah how do i deal with the obliger how, how do i you know if i'm a if i am a rebel I'm, i don't know what i am but if i'm a rebel what's my best stance for dealing with the obliger particularly if she's my mom <laughs> right right well i think i think gretchen would say accountability and the other thing that's interesting because i have listened to her talk about this is that she says like you don't have to change yourself you, it's much easier to just set up a tennis date, right? To have that accountability than try to work on yourself internally, right? So right. Um, a lot of it, I think if you read her work, um, you'll find that there are, it's really concrete a lot of times. That's really great. Yeah. Um, the four tendencies quiz. Okay, great tool. So um, what else are you working on these days? So I am still involved with Carbon Almanac. Um, I was one the managing editor on the kids book, which um, is a free download at um, carbonalmanac.org. Um, and it has, I, I'm, I'm stunned at how a free download spreads so far and fast. Mm -hmm. um, I did not expect that. Um, it, as soon as we released it, we released it last May. Um, and it was an out, it was an out, branch of the rookie section, but it just really expanded far and wide. And lots of adults have said it's really, you know, it's something that they can um, understand and really enjoy because it's really colorful. Um, so anyway, that it, it's been, it's been uh, translated into like 20 languages and I didn't do any of that. It was people came to me and said, can I translate it? And I'm like, yeah, go ahead and do that. People are using it as, in their curriculums. Um, but what's so neat about a free download is that for a teacher, it's free. Like you don't have to worry if you want the whole class to read something, you don't have to have a budget to do that right. when you're downloading a free book. Um, and so that's really satisfying to know that the, the message has spread. Sure. And what is the name? Uh, just remind me of the name. Yeah. So it's called Generation Carbon. Generation it's time Carbon. to start. OK. Um, and Generation C is something that we talk about a lot in the Carbon Almanac mm -hmm. because we're giving these kids right 
the COVID generation, the climate change generation, and the carbon generation. So we've been calling them Generation C, and we think that's an incredibly um, accurate name for who these kids are and what they're going to face. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Um, the uh, And it's a PDF? The, the download. Yeah, so there's a PDF, there, there's a paperback copy, but you don't have to buy oh, it. Right. Um, that's on Amazon, but the, the PDF is um, right at um, Carbon Almanac, thecarbonalmanac.org slash kids. Um, and then you can download it in any language. And my son who has dyslexia mm -hmm. helped me on the um, work on the book. And he actually got Dyslexi Font, um, which is a font that um, people with reading disabilities, it's a little easier for them to read. He got that font donated, which is a huge deal because it's usually a little bit expensive. Um, and so even reading specialists love the book because they can, you know, use it and have that font for, for their kids. So this, um, now I'm interested in this font, um, meaning like things like, say, I don't know, maybe a P and Q or something, there's more of a distinction between them. Yes, it's exactly right. There's weight given at certain points of the letter that make it really clear what letter you're looking at. Yeah. And it's just easier. I think it's just easier on the eyes. Um, any, it, it's, it's actually easier for anybody to read, sure, sure. but especially people with dyslexia. I just came across one put out by the Braille Institute that also is uh, what they call hyper legible. Mm. Um, and that did the same kind of things where they were um, for them, it was where it was kind of blurry. Like, and so they had, it had to kind of be able to come through the blur and really be able to be distinguished, you know, like L and I and things like that. Right. Um, so I'm, so it's maybe not as much of the sight, yeah, you know, problems that dyslexia might have, but it would be interesting to see to compare the two. Um, or maybe I know another tool, another right? Tool. So this font is called what? Dyslexi font. Dyslexi D -Y font. Yes, D Y S L E X I E font. Okay. And again, like you know, you start to write a book. I I had never written a book before. I didn't know you had to get you had to pay for fonts. <laughs> Who knew? Right? But so my son sort of yeah, yeah, um, yeah. took that and ran with it, and um, was really pleased to have that out there. Okay. Um, yeah. No, I I agree. I, I think we all should be reading more legible fonts, um, uh, and even online too. That's where it really shows up. I was complaining just the other day about the fact that it's really hard to distinguish between online anyway what what i see the number one a capital i a lowercase l right they all look the same it's like they all look the same fuck. right yeah if you were trying to teach an alien to read using that it would be difficult yeah. right yes yeah, so we need to, yeah so fonts is one solution or just other new symbols so um so this is really great well i really appreciate your volunteering to um, come on, the, your your passion project sounds fantastic. Yeah, it is. There'll it be is. links um, in the show notes to all if you've included it for us. And um, thank you for for taking time. Oh, I, it was a pleasure. A lot of fun. What a fun thing to do on a Tuesday. <laughs> we'll see you this year. Our cool tools blog will be twenty years old which means we've been posting something new every day for 20 years. It's only possible because of the very engaged and knowledgeable readers and listeners like yourself. You've kept this place going and we are very grateful for you. With this idea of 20 years in mind, um, we decided to try an experiment this year and I'm inviting our guests and listeners to join me on our Cool Tool Show and Tell, which is the program that you're listening to right now. So if you feel you'd make a good guest on this podcast and have four uncommon tools that you'd like to share with us, um, please sign up on our form on the website and we'll see about inviting you. You must be comfortable taking on, talking on a video and um, you need to have some tools that you can show. 
Um, we record on, as you know, on Zoom. We do a YouTube version, a visual video version of it, as well as an audible version. Fill out the form if you're interested and um, list your four, four cool tools and we'll see if there's a good fit. The applications aren't guaranteed in any way. Um, and we're looking at tools that are new to us and appropriate tools and um, whether the times will work for you. So um, we're really interested in hearing from people all over the world, not just in the U.S., although the tools have to be available online, easily available online. And um, if you are a longtime listener, you kind of know what the definition of our tools are. They're very broad. They can be anything that's handy, from something in the kitchen to something you use to travel to a workshop to something professional that we may not know about. We're really interested in things that we don't know anything about. So um, this is an open invitation. We'll give it a try. If you think you make a good guess for this podcast, um, fill out the form. There'll be a link somewhere on our website. Um, and we look forward to, to chatting with you. Thank you. Thank you.